Okay, Riddle of Pancroft Farm, chapter 9 is where we're at, which is page 127. Um, remember you promised yesterday that you would finish reading chapter 8. There's like four pages left. So that's kind of the end for right now of Geordie's story. He told us about Battle of Brandywine. Um, he's got Will home. And if you didn't get it finished, please go back and finish it because there's some important information about... I guess about Will and how Geordie and Mother work together to be kind of deceitful to Father. And that's going to help us in the future, help you understand some things in the future of the book. So chapter 9, page 127. When my alarm went off the next morning, I realized I hadn't filled in my Brandywine study sheet. Geordie and I had been interrupted by Dad, who thumped on the wall and told me to stop muttering and get to sleep. His orders couldn't have come at a worse time. After Giordi had finished telling me of his Brandywine adventures, I had asked him about the secret room in the barn where they hid in Will. I haven't seen anything like that. What did you call it? Grandpa's Folly? I said. I guess it must have been in the part that burned. Right? Geordi had looked at me intently before replying, What a nimble wit you have, Lars. However, did you figure that out? Oh, it was easy enough. There's obviously no secret room in the part that's left, I answered. Obviously not, Geordie had started to say, but the rest of his reply was forestalled by my father's pouncing. Now, as I hastily filled in the blanks in the brandywine paper, I thought the questions were so easy that a sap skull could have answered them. That, and a couple of other interesting things, was what Geordie had told me, had called me when I'd asked why the British hadn't used the bridge across the brandywine instead of marching way up to the forks. I'd showed him Route 1 on my wall map. Lars, you sap skull, you whittling, you great booby. Nary a bridge was built for a score or more years. I chuckled at the memory of Geordie's scolding as I scribbled my answers in the blanks. Then I stuffed the sheet into my backpack and clattered downstairs. As I reached the kitchen, the knocker sounded on the front door. Who could that be at this hour? Dad said from behind his newspaper. Get it, will you, Lars? Obediently, I went to the door. A balding, pudging stranger who looked oddly familiar stood there. I'm Edward Owens, the ninth, he announced in a pompous way. Are your parents at home? I returned to the kitchen and told my folks who it was, adding, I think he's the father of a kid in my class. After Dad went to see what Mr. Owens wanted, Mom made a face. I used to know a guy named Owens who lived around here. He was really a pest. She whispered to me. If he's anything like his son, I think it's the same guy. Dad and Mr. Owens came into the kitchen. My mother stared at the man. Edward? She asked. Sandra, haven't seen you in years, Mr. Owens said. I heard you were staying with Cass. Unfortunately, I didn't know about her passing away until too late to get to the funeral. I just came by to offer my condolences. Mom looked away. Thank you, Edward, she said softly. And to inquire when we might take possession. Dad said sharply, Take possession of what? Pincroft Farm. Surely you knew Cass intended to leave it for a museum. She promised it to me, oh, a good two, ten years ago. My parents looked thunderstruck. Mr. Owens cleared his throat. Well, I wanted to make sure you knew so you could plan to move out as soon as possible. I, 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 Mom gasped. Dad interceded. It's far too soon to be talking about this. Can't you see we're still grieving for her? Besides, I blurted out, she made a new will. Mr. Owen's eyes flicked over to me. Fine, he said dryly. Then we'll see you in probate court. Sandra, good to see you again. Don't bother. I'll see myself out. He strode from the room. The three of us sat in shocked silence. Finally, I spoke up. Don't worry, Mom. I'll find it. Mom sighed and ruffled my hair. I hope you can, Lars. But considering that most of the time, you can't even find your own shoes, I'm not too optimistic. Hey, look at that time. I better run you to the end of the pike or you'll miss your bus. I caught the school bus, but just barely. As soon as I got to the school... Our class climbed onto another bus for a field trip to Brandywine. 
after an hour's ride, Mrs. Hetrick stood up and clapped her hands for attention. Before we go into the park class, we'll take a look at Brandywine Creek itself. After all, if it hadn't been for the creek, the battle here might have gone differently. Yeah, maybe the Americans would have won, Eddie Owens shouted. Despite my best effort to avoid him, he was sitting right behind me. Actually, if it weren't for the creek, the Americans wouldn't have been here. The battle would have been somewhere else, I remarked to no one in particular. Eddie leaned over my shoulder. Fat lot you know about it, Lars, he snorted. You've never even had it in school. You said so yourself. I made a big thing out of wiping off my shoulder where Eddie had snorted. When I looked up, my eyes met those of Pat Hargraves, who looked amused at what I'd done. She quickly looked away. Soon someone pointed out the roadside sign for the village of Chad's Ford. The name caused a lurch of excitement in my stomach. Chad's Ford, where the Americans had waited on the east bank of Brandywine Creek for a massive British attack that had never come. I could almost see Knupphausen's Hessian troops lined up on the west side of the stream to draw Washington's attention away from the real attack coming from behind. I could almost hear the cannon booming on the hillside and see the leaves cut down by grape shot. Eddie Owen's whining voice broke into my private vision. Heck, that creek doesn't look like much, but I could wade that any day, any place. Irritated, I turned around. Not then, you couldn't, Owens. The banks were steep and jammed with trees. You couldn't have gotten through, especially with a pack like those British soldiers had to wear. Bet I could. No way. Mrs. Hutrick materialized in the aisle behind us. I think you boys should stop arguing and concentrate on Brandywine, she said with a frown. From across the aisle, Pat grinned. That's what they're fighting about. Would you believe it? All right, then. Why don't you answer this question? Why did the Americans take up positions here at Brandywine Creek? To stop the British from reaching Philadelphia, which was the capital where the Congress was and all, parroted Eddie. Then enthusiasm spurred him on, and my great-great-great-great-something grandfather practically turned this battle around. Why, he... Mrs. Hetrick's eyes seemed to glaze over. You can tell us all about your illustrious ancestor when we get to the museum, Eddie. But now I want an answer to my question. I heard a voice answering and discovered with some surprise that it was my own. Because this was the main road east from Kennett Square, where the British were camped after marching up from Chesapeake Bay. The Brandywine was the last natural barrier between the British and Philadelphia, except for the Skullkill River, which is at the very doors of the city. The astonishment on Mrs. Hetrick's face, reflected on those of the kids, made me falter into silence. Aren't you the Norweirdigan bookworm? whispered Eddie. Mrs. Hetrick beamed. Good work, Lars. I can tell you've been doing some reading. Cass would have been proud of you. Having so much attention paid to me didn't please Eddie. Mrs. Hetrick? he said, wildly waving his hands. Yes, Eddie, she sighed. Why didn't they just use the bridge? That's what I want to know. I would have just marched my men over that bridge, didn't... Owens, you sap skull, you whittling, you great booby. No bridge was built for a score or more years. I exclaimed in an unconscious echo of Geordie. There was a long moment of silence. Mrs. Hetrick cleared her throat. <clears throat> Perhaps you don't know our school rules, Lars. But we don't allow students to use bad words. Even unfamiliar ones. I'll let it go this time, but... They sure have weird cuss words in Minneapolis, Betty Owens put in, looking smug at my getting into trouble. I didn't learn those words in Minnesota, I began, then stopped when I realized just where I had learned them. I think you've been watching too much Monty Python, Lars, Pat said with a grin. You're getting a British accent. Yeah. Don't forget the guys who talked like that here at Brandywine were wearing red coats, Eddie hooted. Not necessarily, said Mrs. Hetrick. Remember, the Americans were mostly British immigrants and their descendants. It was impossible to identify a man's allegiance by his accent. People talked like that on both sides. 
That's one reason it was so hard to prevent all the spying and to keep track of those who kept switching loyalties. Now, can anyone tell me why Washington didn't know about the Fords upstream? I sat through the filing and paused, determined not to say anything else to embarrass myself. But the pause lengthened until I couldn't stand it anymore. Most of the patriots who lived around here left when they heard Howe was coming, and the people who stuck around were either loyalists, who deliberately lied about the Fords to Washington, or neutrals, like Mr. Welsh of the tavern nearby. He didn't help either side. He just filled their tankards. The other students looked at me blankly. Mrs. Hetrick, intent on getting her main point across to the children, pressed on where I left off. So you see, poor Washington never knew what hit him. I found myself disagreeing aloud with my teacher. No, Mrs. Hetrick, he did have a warning, but it was too late. I think you must be mistaken, Lars. I've never heard of any warning. Where did you read about that? I shrugged and replied vaguely. Somewhere? I don't know. That's what I've been trying to tell you, squeaked Eddie. It was my ancestor who... Here we are, cut in Mrs. Hetrick. Sorry, Eddie, you'll have to tell us later. The bus doors opened and the students spilled out. Half the class milled around the parking lot. Others started to climb the hill toward the picnic area, and the rest began to move in the general direction of the park museum. I feel like General Washington, laughed Mrs. Hetrick. We both have the same problems here at Brandywine, getting our undisciplined troops moving in the right direction at the right time. Just imagine how much more complicated it must have been to get thousands of men where they had to be. She raised her voice and told the stragglers that the class was first to go to the museum and could wander about later. Once inside, we were able to poke around on our own, looking at the exhibits. Some exhibits explained the finer points of the battle, while others held relics of the soldiers themselves, flesh forks, kettle hooks, shaving gear, and other personal stuff found on the battlefield. Though more excited by each display, I tried to cover up my enthusiasm. I didn't want to be teased about my sudden knowledge, especially when I couldn't give a reasonable explanation for it. I'd already blabbed far too much to feel comfortable. With a mask of indifference, I followed the group around the museum. Suddenly, Eddie Owens gave a triumphant shout and pointed at one of the display cases. See? I was right! He crowed. My great, 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 whatever grandfather did warn Washington. I joined the flock of students that clustered around Eddie, who oozed smugness. There under the glass was a photocopy of a letter written by Washington himself. The spidery write, handwriting was hard to read, but a typewritten version lay next to it. With a pounding heart, I read through the flowery salutation and scanned the rest till I came to a section that seemed to jump off the page at me. Despite the men's lack of training, the troops acquitted themselves remarkably well in the field of battle at, at Brandywine. It was cursed ill luck that we failed to learn of the upper fords until so late. If Cheney and the boy hadn't come to warn us of the British flanking action, however. What was a retreat might have been a total destruction. Bless them. I looked up from the letter into Eddie Owen's beaming, chubby face. That boy who warned Washington was my ancestor, said Eddie. My dad is convinced of it. Just think, George Washington actually knew my ancestor and talked to him right here at Brandywine. Hmm and fed him right here at Brandywine, I thought. Geordie's description of the boy filching food from the sideboard at Washington head, Washington's headquarters flashed so vividly in my head that for a moment I could almost see the juices running down Eddie's face. Eddie's ancestor had told George Washington about the Fords and the Brandywine all right, and he told them all wrong. The boy was Squire Cheney, I remembered with a quiet glow of pride. But then Geordie, my friend, my shade. But there was nothing I could say to set the story straight. Mrs. Hetrick bustled up, curious at the crowd around Eddie. Lars, I spoke with the museum guide, and he says you were right. Washington did hear about the flanking from a squire Cheney and a boy who... A boy named Owens, Mrs. Hetrick, interrupted Eddie. Mrs. Hetrick paused. No one knows for sure that knows that for sure, Eddie. It might have been some other boy. 
But look at this letter. 